So thanks. Th th thanks for inviting me. Uh, as all medical academics, I'm going to use slides because without slides, we feel PowerPoint slides are make us. Without them, we're powerless and pointless. That's the. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that all of you, I believe, unequivocally are afraid of infectious diseases. People, human beings, are afraid of infections, and <coughs> I think the media helps with this a great deal. Um, and we're a sea, we're a wash in a sea of Purell. There's nowhere I didn't see any here. I, I'm sure somewhere in this building there is some Purell dispenser. And people, I know I've seen people carry this on their belts now with these extenders. So we're a, we're a wash in a sea of this stuff. <coughs> we see people all over the world now not infrequently wearing masks, and because I'm afraid I'm going to frighten you, I brought a whole box of masks for you, like the Oprah Show. I was going to put them under your seats, but I decided to <laughs> leave them there. I thought, reach under your seat, and we could have everyone wear a mask during this presentation. Uh, it's a bad sign if you're in China and they're spraying outside your hotel, you're wearing those suits, you know something's not going right. And then uh, one of the things that gets my attention is this not a bad vitamin, some vitamins and echinacea and some other secret stuff that you can buy at the airport, but the idea that you're going to think that you're going to get in an airplane and get sick, and by taking that stuff, you're not going to get ill, is kind of middle-agey. You know, I don't mean middle-aged, like, I mean like in the Middle Ages. I don't mean like middle-aged like me. I mean in the Middle Ages, they would have had something like that available so you wouldn't get sick in your travels. And I, I have nothing against that vitamin. I don't want to be sued by that teacher who makes that vitamin. But I don't think you need to take it before you get on an airplane. And then there's the poor toilet seats. What the, the, the notion that the toilet seat will make you sick, there's no evidence of that. There's nothing wrong with toilet seats. And yet, we've become obsessed with making them safer. Um, and now, you know, in many airports and many places, plastic comes out of the wall that covers the toilet seats. How many of you have seen that? Now, let me ask you, how do you even know it's different plastic? What if I tell you right now that this is a scam and it's the same plastic going around and around? You have no, you have no idea what's going on. There's, like, there's not some little guy with a plastic machine behind that. You know, so this toilet seat thing is a problem. And then here's where this is all going. You know, the ultimate kind of human being who's going to not be able to reproduce or eat because they're so, so defended with external uh, devices to prevent infectious diseases. Now, if this weren't enough, the media really wants your attention as well. How many of you saw the movie Contagion? How many of you saw the movie Outbreak? Smaller number. Let's, let's show the scariest trailer ever for this. <laughs> In a remote African jungle, a small monkey is captured. Bound for a pet store in America, the animal carries a deadly virus. Now, I know that some of us have doubts about what we're about to do. It would be less than human if we didn't. But the fate of the nation, perhaps the world, is in our hands. We cannot. We dare not refuse this burden. I'm confident that each of you will do his duty. God forgive us. Your town is being quarantined. We got 19 dead. We got 100 more infected. It's spreading like a brush fire. What are you talking about? If one of them's got it, then 10 of them have got it now. And if one of them gets out of Cedar Creek, we have a very interesting problem. If that bug gets out of there, 260 million Americans will be dead or dying. I'm leaving with the team in an hour. From the heart of a small California town. Damn it, Sam, I want to see these people same as you. To the inner circle of power in Washington. The most optimistic projection for the spread of the virus is this. 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours. The greatest medical crisis of all time. We can't stop it. Begins. Try to remain calm. Many people are dying and are going to continue to die unless we find this monkey. There will be panic, the likes of which we have never seen. There you are. Don't freak out. Those of us who do infectious diseases for a living have the following axiom that all infections have rules. They don't just come from outer space. They all have rules, and our job is to learn the rules because the rules then lead to three opportunities, prevention, treatment, and cure. <coughs> now, by way of dealing with the biology of how infectious diseases work, there are three players in this board game. 
There's the microorganisms, and we, when they make you sick, we call them pathogens. And all of you have been sick at some point with an infection, and at that point, whatever microorganism caused you to be sick is a pathogen. But you are the host. There are more genetic, there are more different genes of microbes living on you and in you than there are human genes on you and in you, because you are totally covered with all kinds of stuff that I don't want to tell you about. But fortunately, you're incredibly defended. Evolution, getting back to the earlier talk, has provided you with massive defenses, so you rarely become uh, sick with an infection. And then the environment defines your risk. Now, the environment is not just about climate, which we like to talk about. It's everything you do, everything you eat, everywhere you go, everything you touch, those people you communicate with. There are different ways infections are spread. There's human to human spread. We call those communicable diseases, and those are the ones we worry most about because they can spread to cause epidemics where more than one person has a disease, and pandemics where they're global spread. There's animal to human. Remember petting zoos, sometimes if animals contaminated with E. coli, small children pet the animals and become sick with those E. coli. There's insect to human disease, that's uh, malaria is the best example, but we increasingly worry about dengue because as it gets warmer, insects are coming from <coughs> places where dengue is endemic and making it to the, the southern part of the United States. And there's environmental contamination where you touch a thing acquire an organism and it makes you sick. There are three ways infections spread. There are three components of the spread of infection. There's efficiency. Efficiency, how easy is it from the, for the microbe to go from one person to another, from a surface to another? How many particles does it take? Something that's efficient is worse than something that's not efficient. Chicken pox is very efficient. Some of the older people in the room's mothers, who are not all that kind, took them to chicken pox parties. What, what was that? One kid in the neighborhood got chicken pox, they said, let's all get together. Mrs. Boyarski remembers this problem. And so then 14 days later, because chicken pox is so efficient, every kid had chicken pox. This was so the moms didn't get inconvenienced with chicken pox at a different point in time. <laughs> and I'm not mad at the moms. We now have a vaccine. There's the duration of infectiousness. Infections that kill the host real quickly, like in Cedar Creek, Rene Rousseau's finest work and maybe last movie. Infections that kill the host too quickly can't sustain an epidemic. Infections that are not seen and remain contagious for long periods of time can sustain huge epidemics. And then the number of people exposed. If one person or two people are exposed, you don't have an epidemic. If multiple people are exposed, you might have an epidemic. How many of you vomited? Well, let me ask a personal question, but you don't have to tell me. How many of you, some of you, let me say it this way, some of you vomited this winter, and it wasn't all from bad food. Some of you acquired norovirus. This is a very contagious virus. It's very efficient. Fewer than 20, 20 particles can cause human disease. <coughs> Contagion can last for weeks on an inanimate surface. It can go from human to human and from inanimate surfaces to human. So epidemics are possible. And this is the cruise ship you don't want to be on. If you're looking outside your window and you see these guys getting on your cruise ship, you might think you're on the wrong boat. Um, this is not the love boat. Um, and and um, it turns out cruise ships are a particular problem because people are in close quarters. And when the environment gets contaminated, it's very difficult to decontaminate the surfaces that contain a single particle of norovirus. Also, the host, you young people, are incredibly defended. But I'm less defended because I'm getting older. And the 80-year-old host is even less defended. On that boat, on the love boat, are a lot of 80-year-olds who take very few particles of norovirus. And by the way, there's another problem with these boats. Sometimes they never make it home. These people on the deck are spelling help. This is that recent cruise ship that limped home to Alabama. You know, they had to tow it in for days and days and days. So cruise ships I'm not real big on. But no offense to cruise ships. <laughs> now, um, I started my career in 1980. I came to Chapel Hill in 1979, 1980. I was actually living in China. And when I got to Chapel Hill, um, a new disease had surfaced called gay-related immunodeficiency disease, GRID. A small number of gay men acquired unusual um, super infections and died. Some of them got cancers and died. And we had no idea what was causing this disease. So now, all these years later, all of you are familiar with human immunodeficiency to virus, virus and AIDS. But GRID, when it surfaced, had no rules. It was a new disease for the species. This is what I looked at like when I started working on this. Now, why am I showing you this? I was the same age as, as Flora, and that's my infant daughter, Jessie, on my back, which Mrs. who Mrs. Boyarski taught. Think about how long ago that was. And so all of you are going to age, if you're lucky, and go from what that looked like to what this looks like, which is not, I'm not, I'm not claiming that's desirable. I'm saying it can happen. 
Now, during the course of those 30 years, this small grid problem, over five years, it was recognized that grid was actually a viral infection ca caused by a human immunodeficiency virus. And this became the pandemic of the century, with now, today, 34 million people infected, 35 million people have died from this infection. So I spent my entire career working on this one problem, on this infection, and learning the rules. And Myself and my colleagues in Chapel Hill, um, and I, I had to mention the city of Chapel Hill, Mayor Bell. I hope you don't mind. Um, so my colleagues in Chapel Hill and many other universities spent their entire careers working on the rules. The rules allow us to do prevention, treatment, and cure. What are the rules? This disease is primarily spread by sex. 80% of all cases are, are sexually transmitted. Blood and blood products can spread the disease, but we can make those products safe. And mothers can spread the disease to their babies during birth and after birth, and a little bit before birth. The problem with HIV, unlike the Cedar Creek disease, that virus Dustin Hoffman so bravely took care of, the problem is, is that HIV remains contagious for life. We have three options, prevent it, treat it, and cure it. We work on all three options. My work has been on prevention. I had a very simple idea. As treatment became available, we said treatment's available. Everyone's going to be treated eventually because treatment is life-saving. In incredible breakthrough to make these drugs that can save someone's life. And by the way, today if you get tested and you're positive and you start treatment early, you live a completely normal lifespan, which is amazing when you think of all the death that occurred in the 80s. <clears throat> we had this idea then, treatment that was required anyhow, maybe it could prevent transmission. In order to study that, we've, we were going to study discordant couples. What's a discordant couple? One person's HIV infected, they're called the, the, the index case, the infected person. Their sexual partner is HIV negative. So that's a discordant couple. People who are both not infected are called concordant negative. People who are both infected are called concordant positive. In this study, that's called HBTN052, we studied 1,763 couples at 13 sites in nine countries. Um, we did everything possible beyond just treating the index case to prevent infection. We may, gave out free condoms, we, we educated people, but nevertheless, transmission would occur, and we were able to power the study to understand could we prevent HIV transmission by treating the infected person because we knew that the drugs we were going to use would concentrate in the secretions that are involved in sexual transmission. Does this make sense? Okay. But we had to figure out which drugs to use. That took us 10 years. We needed drugs that concentrated in sexual secretions. We had to get the drugs for free, $30 million worth of free drugs. We had to convince the NIH to pay for the study, and the study took a very long time. It was 10 years of developing the drugs and figuring out which drugs to use, and then 10 more years to do the study. So this is a 20-year investment of time to make a point. On April 28th of 2011, an oversight board met with us. Now, we never saw a result in those 10 years. Everything's blinded to the people doing the research because they don't want to contaminate the results of the research. The oversight board told us to make the results public. So we, had, we said, what results? And they said, these results, that when you treat the infected person, you prevent infection 96% of the time, almost 100% of the time. This, obviously, to us was an astounding finding. <clears throat> Michelle Sidibe, the head of uh, UNAIDS, indicated it was a game changer for the field of AIDS prevention. Science Magazine made it the breakthrough of the year, and Bruce Albert, whose mouth has moved because of the wonderful graphics, um, <laughs> indicated that, that this galvanized uh, different ways of thinking about preventing HIV infection. The Economist declared the end of AIDS. We thought this was hyperbolic, but the point is, if you've worked a very long time on a problem and you've given a number to, uh, uh, to a solution, you're, you're happy with it. And then the, Clint, uh, the Obama administration um, developed a phrase, the AIDS-free generation. Hillary Clinton, in a remarkable moment, went to the NIH to give a speech, because she's the Secretary of State, went to the NIH, and in the speech indicated the, the Obama administration believed that the breakthroughs, not just our work, but many breakthroughs in AIDS could lead to an AIDS-free generation. And it raised the kind of uh, optimism that surrounds the prevention of HIV. Now, I've told you this story because I wanted to show you a new pathogen that we had no idea about, followed by learning the rules, followed by science using those rules to interfere with the transmission, leading to prevention. We're also into better treatment. I've already told you proper treatment leads to a full life, no death, and now we're into cure. And in your generation, I'm just about sure HIV will be cured, 
or treated so differently that it will look like a cure. The problem is I've only talked about one disease. Look at all these other new and emerging infections. There's a lot of them for you to worry about, hence the masks. Coronavirus, SARS, that was a big warning, the severe respiratory disease. This became worldwide news. China closed the city of Beijing and took everybody's temperature walking down the street. You couldn't, when you could finally fly in and out of cities that had SARS, they took your temperature, you were isolated. If your body temperature was elevated, this, this caused massive change. So if you think about turning points, you think you're in control, but external forces may have huge effects on the species, such as SARS. Ultimately, 8,400 people got SARS um, in 29 countries. About 10% of these people died. And there was a huge risk to healthcare workers, many of whom died trying to take care of SARS until what? Until they understood the rules. Once we understood the rules, there were no further deaths among healthcare workers. Not to frighten you, but coronavirus is back. And so in Saudi Arabia, there have been 18 to 20 people who've developed a new coronavirus infection, some of whom have died. Why are we worried about this? Because in October, October 13th, they'll have the Hajj. The Hajj will bring a huge number of people to Mecca. Should this human-to-human -human uh, pathogen become a problem, it would be, as they say in Cedar Creek, that would be, a, I, I want to imitate Dustin Hoffman, I can't quite do it. I really wanted to rehearse. We'd have a very interesting problem. <laughs> um, and if that weren't bad enough, China, which is always a place that interests us, has a new influenza called H7N9. It surfaced in China. These are a little out of date. About five new people are getting infected a day. So far, at least 17 have been infected. Six are dead. Right now, the source is infected chickens. Chinese love chicken. It's a huge market. And they hate killing chickens. But they're killing a lot of chickens. If you wanted to kill a chicken in North Carolina, you'd be in federal court before one chicken could die. In, 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 in Durham, I don't, there's no way you could kill a chicken. Impossible. But, but in China, they go and they'll slaughter millions of chickens, because the chickens in many places in China appear to be contaminated with H7N9. There's a story in the New York Times about this today. And they're hoping that the slaughtering of chickens will reduce the number of infections. And they're praying, what? That this stays chicken to human and doesn't go human to human. Because if it goes human to human, we're back to Cedar Creek. And we have, as Dustin Hoffman would put it, a very interesting problem. Because flu pandemics scare us. The good news for those in your age group, there is no vampire virus, OK? I know you love this Twilight series. No vampire virus. Jacob, there is no werewolf virus, OK? There's no possibility this is going to be a problem for you. And most important, there is no zombie virus. None of you are going to come back as the living dead. It's impossible, OK? So the big fears you have don't require a mask. And I would argue to end this that you've got to remain calm Infectious disease people look for the rules. The rules offer solutions. And so every time we're confronted with a new organism, what we do is we say, let's learn the rules as quickly as possible. And then we intervene with prevention, treatment, and cure. Thank you. <clears throat>